Australia, 2007. Paraglider Eva Vishniuska is in the wrong place at the wrong time. Everybody was thinking, okay, we are fast enough to fly away from this cloud. But no one anticipated the immensity of the storm. It was the biggest and strongest thunderstorm that I ever saw. We knew we are playing with fire now. It was like a giant hoover sucking them up. This is the extraordinary story of a paraglider who cheated death. Ten kilometers above the earth. In 2006, one of the world's leading paragliders, Eva Vishniuska, narrowly escapes death in a freak accident in the Swiss Alps. With a fractured pelvis, her dream of winning the upcoming world championships in Australia seems over. The beautiful thing in paragliding is you don't need anybody. You just take your backpack, go up, and you just glide totally free. Before I started flying, I didn't really know what to do in my life. When I started paragliding, uh, it was like a virus. I couldn't get rid of it. So I changed everything. I decided to live in a car, just following the competitions. So everything in my life was around flying. In only her fourth year of competitive flying, Eva Vishniuska is already the top-ranked female paraglider in the world. Eva Vishniuska, who is the first one on this event? I was the German champion, then I won one World Cup, second one, third one, fifth one, and it's like collecting <laughs> the titles, and the only title I didn't own was the world champion. So of course it was a big dream to have this one. Just six months after fracturing her pelvis, Ava has fought her way back into contention for the world championship. Just a few short years, the outback town of Manila has become a mecca for paragliders the world over. 150 pilots from 34 countries will challenge for the world title, the highest accolade in paragliding. Before the world championships in Manila, I had a big accident in Switzerland. I had to work a lot on my physical strength to to get to the top again. You're listening to Breakfast, ABC New England Northwest. A big hello to paraglider pilots from around the world in town for the paragliding championships. The forecast looking clear, variable winds, but some storm clouds brewing this afternoon. In the week before the world championships, Ava and the German team are taking part in a cross-country event called the XC Open. I wanted to participate in the XC Open, to know about the area, where are the good places, where are the difficult parts, just to be prepared for the world. Mm -hmm. 
German team leader Stefan Mast is responsible for the safety of Eva and the other six German pilots. Eva was physically fit and she was also mentally top of the game. She was not going for the female title, she was going for best place in the competition. Another member of the German team is Andreas Malecki, who has been training with Eva for the past three years. Eva is a very important pilot, one of the best girls from the world, and um, she will beat the boys, not only the girls. Anyone wants to come to this briefing, you want to be here in the next 30 seconds, please? The director of the Manila Cross Country Championship is Godfrey Wenis, one of the most experienced pilots in the world. Wenis is the former world record holder for long distance paragliding. The person that uh, wins an XC Open World Series event, which is an endurance event as opposed to a drag race, is the person that flies the furthest by the end of the day. So it needs not just speed, but endurance. And it's not just a physical endurance, it's also mental endurance. In a cross-country event, pilots are permitted to fly in any direction they choose. The early start of the clouds is to the north of us here, and you can see to the north of us is where they are the biggest now. So quite obviously... By the time the pilots assemble on Mount Bora for their weather briefing, the threat of severe thunderstorms to the north has increased dramatically. And that I made quite clear for them, that there was a line there. If you get there early, you'll be able to pass through and continue on on a long flight. But if you get there late, you might be stuck at a dead end, effectively. At 11.30, the pilots begin launching from Mount Bora. Basically half an hour after the briefing, probably about half the pilots are flying. Around 50 to 60 in the air at that stage, most headed north. Paragliders use rising columns of hot air known as thermals to gain altitude. When cross-country flying, they make distance by climbing in these thermals and using the prevailing winds to glide down from one to another. Clouds in our game are of course lift and the quicker it is the faster you go on your average speed so the guys are looking for the bigger clouds in order to maximize their cross-country speeds. To win that day they would have definitely had to fly with full tailwind and fly towards the emerging clouds and get past it before it turns into a line of thunderstorms or indeed some larger cells for the bigger clouds in order to maximize their cross-country speeds. To win that day, they would have definitely had to fly with full tailwind and fly towards the emerging clouds and get past it before it turns into a line of thunderstorms or indeed some larger cells. After launching, the paragliders form into groups known as gaggles. Due to a southerly wind, most pilots in the first gaggle elect to fly north. With the clock already ticking, they need to quickly navigate past the areas of atmospheric instability that lie ahead. Sixty minutes into the launch window, the German team prepares to take off. We didn't want to take off very early. We decided to let some people fly, so the air is marked. The thermals are already marked by the other pilots, so you can fly faster just following them. Ava makes her pre-flight checks and sets her GPS track log to record. As we realize we have a southerly wind, we knew we have to fly north between those clouds. But they were that far that at the moment of the takeoff, it was not really looking like a big danger. You could see the clouds forming and popping up all over the places, that there was more activity to the north, but it, there was no real thunderstorm or pre-thunderstorm seen at that time. But Ava's friend, Austrian paraglider Gerald Amaseda, is already concerned about the possibility of a thunderstorm. When I first arrived at Mount Bora, 
and I saw these clouds, I was sure inside that the day will be not good. I was sure about uh, the humidity. I was sure about the possibility of thunderstorms inside of me. I was sure. But this is the problem with competitions. I felt a little pressure because I was in a competition. And I, yeah, you go, you go flying. Freak storms are one of the biggest risks to paragliders at the top of their game. It's the one element they can't control. Once in the air, they're in constant radio contact with their ground crews, who monitor the weather and follow the pilots cross-country to retrieve them from their landing points. The first time I radio Stefan was when I was at the cloud base. The first part of the flight was actually easy. I followed the ridge north and I think about 20 k's, then the ridge stops and the flatlands begins. At the time when people were launching and flying and for the first hour or two of their flight, they thought it was a relatively standard cross-country day, very unremarkable in every respect. The group split up into two, so Eva was actually at the rear end of the lead group, so the, the front runners in her group were already through the section of clouds before the clouds started to get really big and strong above their heads. Gerald is now flying alongside Eva at the back of the lead gaggle. I knew about the problem with the clouds. But in a race, we try to, to find good thermals. So on this day, our strategy uh, was for our team to go between these clouds and to fly north as long as possible. 50 meters to their right is 42-year-old He Zhongpin, a member of the national Chinese team. Zongpin had been flying since the 90s and he was one of their senior pilots in the team, so the rest of the younger members of the team respected him. He was up there with the top pilots in the world, yeah, so he was right mixing it with them at that exact stage. A handful of pilots have successfully navigated a course past the developing storm. A small cloud in front of Ava, Gerald and Zhongpin stands between them and clear skies. It was clear that the lead group that Eva was in would be coming quite close to those larger clouds and they'd be running a fine gauntlet between two of the larger cells. The clouds were really black and big and I started to get worried about it. I started to get concerned. The two big clouds were growing really fast. We could see that it's getting very dark. So we knew we are playing with the fire now. But in front of us, the sky was looking really nice with nice cumulus clouds. Everybody was thinking, OK, we are fast enough to fly away from this cloud. Being an XC open, the pilots get to make their own decisions once they start flying. How you predict the weather to be is your own personal safety, and it can be the difference between life and death sometimes. So from the viewpoint of the pilots who were in the rear group, it was clear that up ahead there was a solid line of cloud developing. Most of the rear group elected to land at that stage. Nach 50, 60 kilometer wurde es mir einfach viel zu heiß in Luft. Also meine Schwelle war erreicht, wo ich einfach dachte, jetzt wird es zu gefährlich. Und dann funkte ich Stefan an und sagte, mir wird es jetzt zu gefährlich, ich gehe jetzt runter. Und äh, in dem Augenblick also, habe ich dann gar nicht mehr realisiert, wo Eva dann auch war. Aber also, kurz vorher war sie noch einen Kilometer vor mir. As dozens of pilots start going to ground, the severity of the storm cell is becoming apparent. The clouds were forming into very high clouds, 
and it started to rain. We knew there's a big difference between thunderstorms in mountain terrains and in flatlands, but actually at that time it was, uh, it was, we underestimated it, of course. We could see a very tall, towering, cumulonimbus cloud just reaching its mature phase where it was starting to develop very, very quickly and some rain was just starting to appear on one corner of it. I had a cloud in front of me. I knew I cannot pass below the cloud, otherwise I get sucked into the cloud with the thermal, so I decided to fly around. On the flatlands around Manila, Storms normally develop slowly over a matter of hours. But today, the clouds are growing rapidly, forming a line of cumulonimbus cells. If these cells merge, they will create a severe thunderstorm. The developing small cloud the pilots are trying to fly around suddenly gets sucked into the larger clouds, creating a massive storm cell, now measuring 20 kilometers wide. Eva, being at the back end of the lead group, would have seen the leaders flying away from her, and she was desperately trying to catch them, of course, to stay in contention. She would have seen a little bit of blue still ahead, but what she wouldn't have seen was how tall the clouds were and how dark and menacing they looked at that point. Because from where we were behind, we could see this tall towering stuff, and once you're underneath it, you can't quite tell. She wasn't alone, of course. She was with a few other very competitive pilots. In paragliding competitions, you are focused on winning. You push the limits. You just forget your safety and your life. It's kind of adrenaline and emotions. You just focus. For me, it was a race against time. I saw two Swiss pilots in front of me. I think about 500 meters. They flew between the clouds really fast, made it. They are flying out. And I remember that I tried the same. We were not fast enough. The two clouds started to, to growing up to one cloud. It was like uh, the cloud catched me and I was no chance to get out of it. The clouds came together to form one very large cloud, and when that occurred, it was basically game over for Eva and the other pilots with her. It was like a giant hoover sucking them up to great heights, and they couldn't do anything about it at that point. A giant hoover sucking them up to great heights, and they couldn't do anything about it at that point. Suddenly I hit very strong lift and it sucked me into the cloud. You can feel all the area of the glider pulling you up and I felt pressed in my harness and just going up very fast. This phenomenon known as cloud suck is extreme lift due to a thermal at the base of towering cumulonimbus clouds. The taller the cloud, the greater the lift. At the center of the dreaded thunderstorm, this extremely strong updraft produces hail, rain, gale force winds, and cloud-to-cloud -cloud lightning. My heart was beating because I knew that we are now in a big shit and we have to go down as fast as we can. The pilots are forced to perform an emergency descent maneuver known as spiraling. A full spiral dive, the glider points at the ground, pulling a lot of G-force. Your face starts to feel like it's going back, your arms become very heavy, and all the time your instruments are beeping at you like crazy, the GPS is going, the compass is going around in circles. And that, in effect, is a very hard position to hold as well, but they know if they release it, that they'll get sucked up even quicker. I just couldn't manage, just physically, the power in the spiral is so strong, the 
I almost black out. That spiral dive can lead to descent rates in the still air of around 20 metres a second, but the updraft itself would have been doing upwards of 30 or 40 metres per second when she got inside the cloud. So effectively she had no way to escape it whatsoever, she was stuck. I saw Eva on the left side of my field of vision. She made this barrel for one or two minutes, but then the film was so strong that it was like a hand picked her up and took her out. Moments later, Chinese pilot He Zhongping is also sucked into the storm. Ava's friend Gerald continues to spiral to try to break out of the updraft. Gerald didn't realize at the time, but when he popped out the side of the storm, he was very lucky. He was just on the edge of the big storm that sucked up Eva. I got in a smaller thermal, then I had the chance. It was just a chance, a chance to go down. I was out of the cloud. I saw the farm. I saw my landing field, and I was sure that I can make it. Landing near some old farm buildings, Gerald is forced to shelter from the fierce lightning storm. I ran to the other pilot, to the shelter. The lightnings were so strong and the wind is blowing and we realized that maybe we can have a problem with the lightnings. It was for me the biggest and uh, strongest thunderstorm that I ever saw. I was sure that Eva and the Chinese pilots will have a big, big problem. Maybe they, they will not be alive. Gerald makes contact with the Austrian team leader. He gives him his coordinates. I started to think about that we have to wait after the thunderstorm is finished, and then we have to look around for these two pilots. I started to realize what happened. Having narrowly escaped the storm cell, Gerald is now acutely aware of the danger facing Ava and Jean-Pin. I was very scared to be inside this thunderstorm. It's like you are in the middle of the ocean and suddenly you have 100 sharks around you. You cannot do anything. The only thing she could do was to keep the glider flying. That was critical. You don't know where you are in relation to the wing half the time because it's almost pitch black. So she's just trying to guess what's happening. Feel the pressure in the brakes to understand if the glider's pitching forwards or backwards with the hope in the background that maybe, just maybe, the storm might spit her out one side before it takes her up into the icy heights. In an extraordinary feat of endurance, Zhong Pin has battled his way to the edge of the storm cell. All of a sudden, as he was a little bit further away from either and more to the edge of the storm cloud, the storm cloud released him and he started to come down. At that point, lightning struck. I could hear a lightning behind me. So I was really praying, if there are some angels or gods, please help me. And I, I didn't stop. I, I was really hoping and believing that it's going to be all right. Driving the German retrieval van, team leader Stefan Mast remains unaware of the danger Ava faces. At that time, I didn't know where she is. I knew that she was far ahead of my position, and I only knew that I'm under heavy rain, and uh, I couldn't see her. Ava makes a desperate attempt to contact her support team. After there was no 
response anymore. For me, it was clear that uh, this has a this situation has a big potential that uh, this pilot will be the first I cannot bring back alive. The lowest layer of the Earth's atmosphere, the troposphere, provides just enough oxygen for humans to survive. In mountaineering, the air above 7,000 meters is known as the death zone, where the body uses oxygen faster than it can be replenished. No one has ever been above 7,000 meters and survived before. In fact, previously, pilots were even dying at 6,000 meters and 5,000 meters due to turbulence and hailstones and lack of oxygen and hypothermia. My eyes are getting black and all my energy, all my power just left me. No longer able to withstand the force of the storm, Ava is now being swept up towards the death zone. While waiting for the Austrian team to pick him up, Gerald calls Ava's team leader, Stefan Mast. I tell the German team that Ava is in a big problem and they will not listen to me. I was frustrated and I was angry about it. I was angry about it because I had lost friends in thunderstorms. This was so big and the thunderstorm, uh, the, the lightning, I was in a position where I had no chance to help Eva because it was raining like hell. Stefan receives a radio call from team member Andreas Malecki, who has landed 10 kilometers away. I was glad to have another radio call from Andreas Malecki, who reported his position where he safely landed and I could take care of somebody from my team, but during the whole time, my thoughts were, of course, with Eva. Another radio call from Andreas Malecki, who reported his position where he safely landed and I could take care of somebody from my team. But during the whole time, my thoughts were, of course, with Eva. Eva has now reached a height of almost 7,000 meters. She is now just below the death zone. The GPS recording device was recording climb rates in excess of 40 meters a second at times, which is an incredible climb rate. Having been taken up into those heights so quickly, she only had two minutes to acclimatize. The atmosphere is getting thinner, there's less oxygen there. It's getting colder, down to minus 40 degrees, minus 45 degrees. And then she passes out, blacks out. No longer in control of her glider, Ava is now hurtling up through the storm at 100 kilometers per hour. Ava's track log reads 9,946 meters, more than a kilometer higher than Mount Everest. She's at the very edge of the stratosphere. Exposed to temperatures of minus 55 degrees Celsius, her freezing body has lapsed into a hibernating state. The glider kept flying at that point, and at the very top of the storm cloud, the air isn't as turbulent anymore, so it didn't actually need any piloting inputs, because the paraglider is actually very stable due to a pendulous situation. The pilot hangs underneath like a pendulum and gives it stability. So her being blacked out inherently wasn't such a dangerous thing. If anything, it might have even saved a life. 
The freezing temperature has slowed Ava's metabolism down. Her body now focuses its remaining resources on keeping her vital organs working. Lack of oxygen at that altitude, normally you would only survive 10 or 20 seconds. Mountaineers can survive at extreme altitudes in specialist clothing with slow acclimatization and bottled oxygen. Ava, floating 10 kilometers above Earth, has only flimsy clothing and no life support. She should, in theory, already be dead. She needed to get down as quick as she could before the lack of oxygen and the temperature took its toll and killed her. With the storm finally having passed, Stefan locates Andreas Malecki. Er kam dann auch dann aus dem Auto raus und äh, ja und machte eigentlich keinen guten Gesichtsausdruck und er sagte mir, Eva ist in der Wolke. We were aware that uh, one of our pilots was missing and he, he said uh, that he thinks that uh, we will not see her again. So dass wir dann eigentlich dann ganz klar die Vermutung hatten, das kann keiner überleben in dem Gewitter. Wenn man auf 4000 Meter ist und immer weiter nach oben gezogen wird, da ist Hagel, da ist Blitzschlag, da ist Erfrierung, da ist alles Mögliche. Das kann man nicht überleben. The German team starts to sweep the vast Manila flatlands for Ava. If she had escaped the storm and managed to land, she will almost certainly require medical assistance. Ja, also ich habe dann direkt versucht, Evas Handy anzutelefonieren. Und da war kein Freizeichen, also da hörte man gar nichts, also der Anschluss war tot. Unconscious, Ava has been floating at the edge of the stratosphere for nearly 45 minutes. No human has survived at this altitude for this length of time before. Even if Ava survives, brain damage and organ failure are now a real possibility. There's Eva at over 30,000 feet in the ice crystal zone at the top of a storm cloud being suspended by six kilograms of nylon called a paraglider. Her body was slumped to one side as she was unconscious. As she was leaning to one side, the glider developed a turn, a very long, lazy turn, and that's evidence from what we saw on the track log. So for about 40 to 45 minutes, she was doing very large and very smooth 360-degree turns. At minus 55 degrees Celsius, Ava's wing has iced over, and her harness is now heavy with hail. Suddenly, the wing stalls and collapses. She's coming down through a very thin atmosphere in excess of 200 kilometers an hour, which is faster than what you free fall at at lower levels. So short of the lines actually snapping, it doesn't get much worse than this. She hasn't got very many seconds to go before she runs into the ground. But after dropping nearly 3,000 meters, something miraculous occurs. At around 6,900 meters, the glider reopens and starts flying again, all by itself. And Eva then at that point comes to. It's increased atmosphere, more oxygen, warmer conditions, her body has reanimated itself and she's got a last chance now to survive and get away from this cloud. When I woke up, I didn't know for how long time I was unconscious. It seemed to me like it was five, a few seconds or maybe a minute. 
I scratch the eyes of the screen of the GPS to see the altitude and I was still on 6,900 meters. Ava is now just below the death zone. Disoriented and enveloped in thick cloud, she has almost zero visibility and her glider is covered in ice. The worst thing was the amazing cold. I was still shaking and I was just trying to fly straight. Now at the edge of the cloud, Ava is in danger of being sucked back into the storm cell. It's not over yet. She's still got to get on the ground to be safe. She might have been slightly delirious. And that's where instinct and experience comes into play when you do things in an automatic mode. She had the presence of mind and the stubbornness and the willpower to keep flying the glider and to make good decisions. That was really critical then for her not to do something silly like perform a manoeuvre that she might lose control in, for example. A lesser pilot may have not managed to do that under those circumstances. Keep flying the glider and to make good decisions. That was really critical then for her not to do something silly like perform a manoeuvre that she might lose control in, for example. A lesser pilot may have not managed to do that under those circumstances. I knew I'm so close to death and the only persons I was thinking about were my parents. I couldn't imagine my parents if I would die there. And I was praying, no, 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 please, not here, not now. And that was all. Only to survive and to concentrate on what I can do. It was so cold that I realized I have to do something to get down faster, otherwise I will not survive. I decided to spiral, just soft, to go down. It's still a long flight to come down. I knew that the glider is full of water and ice, and it will be very dangerous. All the time I was fighting, I knew I will never give up. And it was actually the only thing, to concentrate what you can to do and, and don't give up. There was a rumor that one Chinese pilot was missing because there was no radio contact and nothing. The discovery of Zongpin's body came as a bit of a shock to everybody. We had hoped he survived. The body of pilot He Zhongpin was discovered four kilometers from where he was first sucked into the storm. The lightning strike had killed him instantly. That affected the entire community uh, that was there in Manila at the time. The, all the pilots were extremely down about it, and of course the Chinese pilots were in a, quite a state of shock that that had actually happened to one of their more mature pilots. That was something that was very unexpected. After 20 minutes, the storm has passed the Austrian pilots trapped in the barn. Now, under clear skies, the Austrian team leader reaches Gerald, and they begin their desperate search for Ava. We didn't know where we can look, but we tried to look around for the orange wing, maybe to see her. I saw the earth, it was the most beautiful moment, like coming from the cosmos. 
coming back to the earth. After 45 minutes slowly spiraling her way down, Ava is now seven kilometers from where she was first sucked into the storm. I could see a small farm. I just turned against the wind and could land safely. Ava has landed in an isolated paddock far from main roads and her support team. I didn't care about how long does it take to get home or if somebody's going to find me. I knew I survived and this was the most, most important. But I was so freezing that I was just thinking, what can I do to get warm? I started to run away to get warm, but I was too tired, so I just curled down. I tried again to use my radio because I thought it's warmer, maybe it works now. But it didn't work at all. Suddenly, I could hear my mobile phone. I forgot completely that I have it with me. Und das sagt die auch direkt, Stefan. Sag ich höre Freizeichen, was ich vorher nicht gehört habe. When I found it in my cockpit, I could hear Andreas Malecki. Eva, Eva. But the connection cut out. The reception was not perfect, so I decided to write the coordinates for my GPS in the SMS and send them when I had the reception again. Ja, als ich dann Evas Stimme so die ersten Worte von Eva am Telefon hörte. Da passierte genau das, was ich jetzt auch äh, verspüre. Ich bekam eine Gänsehaut, das war einfach. Und sie sagte, mir ist kalt, kommt schnell. Sag ich, Eva, gib mir uns die Koordinaten von dir. Six, five. I was so happy, I have contact with my team. And I could give them the coordinates. I knew they are coming. With confirmation that Ava has survived the storm, her teammates still need to pinpoint her exact location in the vast western plains. Ava's core body temperature has dropped below that required for normal metabolism and bodily function. She is in danger of dying before help can reach her. The Germans suddenly realize that Gerald and the Austrian team are only 20 kilometers from Ava's location. When I found out that uh, Ava is alive, I felt pressure to go there as quick as I can. I thought that the chance is very small that she will stay alive. Uh, Ava is alive, I felt pressure to go there as quick as I can. I thought that the chance is very small that she will stay alive.
The Austrian team is shocked to find Ava's paraglider still intact and her harness almost completely filled with ice and hailstones. After some minutes, Stefan arrived with the other team pilots and they were all happy to see me alive and they helped me to go to the car and the get out with the other Austrian pilots, took my gear. I called up Gottfried to ask him to which hospital we can go. And on the back seat of the car, Eva was uh, checking her GPS uh, and uh, she mentioned a few times that she was close to 10,000 meters. And he said, no, I don't believe it. Die haben wir dann so einfach abgetan. So ein Gerät muss ja nicht optimal laufen, haben wir gedacht vorher. Aber hinterher, als wir diesen Track dann da wirklich minutiös ausgelesen haben und dann realisiert hatten, wie hoch die dann war, da standen wir dann da vor dem Computer und sagten, boah, so viel Glück kann, kann das geht, gibt's gar nicht, was die hatte. I remember that I was not surprised, because I know how quick it worked inside the cloud and I just remember that I was not surprised of the attitude, but I was of course surprised that she's still alive. Incredibly, Ava is discharged from hospital soon after arriving. Her only visible injuries are frostbite to her ears and legs. The doctor couldn't imagine I survived at this altitude and he measured the oxygen in my blood and said everything looks fine. He couldn't believe. So the hail... Word quickly spreads about Ava's miracle flight. A paraglider has told of being sucked into a thunderstorm, frozen, then spat out. Ava was swept so high she suffered frostbite and passed out, but incredibly she's caught in a thunderstorm in Australia whilst training for the World Championship. A second paraglider, a Chinese man, died in the storm. The euphoria surrounding Ava's survival was tempered by the tragic death of He Jongpin. The tight-knit paragliding community was stunned. A lot of people focused on the survival of Eva, forgetting a little bit about the fact that someone had actually died as well. We actually didn't fly the next day as a result of the hearing of the news that he was found deceased. Eva was shocked because at the moment where the track lock was stopped, probably by, by the lightning, the distance between Eva and this, uh, this Chinese pilot was only five or six hundred meters. I knew that what happened was the result of my mistake and I knew in the future I have to take my decisions on myself and don't look what are the others doing and I knew this will never happen again. There is still water inside. It's an absolute amazing story, of course, that Eva so, so survived in such an altitude. But for me, it's more interesting how she could land this, this paraglider, this wing. She was able to fly a very, very heavy wing, and she landed, and I don't know how she made it. This is incredible, unbelievable. She survived, she wanted to live, and she wanted to go further. Das gibt's kein zweites Mal sowas, dass man das überlebt. Und einem noch so, so gut geht danach. 
Also das war auf jeden Fall ein Wunder. Six days later, in a remarkable show of courage, Ava makes her way back to the summit of Mount Bora. Most people would never fly again after that, and within a week when she was fine, she went out and flew again, which was extremely impressive for everyone to watch. TV crews were there. It was, it was a, quite a moment, actually, to watch her take to the skies in the same glider as well, I might add. For us, that was the miracle. I wanted to be alone and to have my peace. I had to think about the Chinese pilot. I couldn't understand why I could survive and he not. But then I knew, okay, I was lucky. I, maybe I have some special reason to stay in this world. Thanks.